Hey there, everybody. It's Mark Crowley. I'm back with another video. This is the latest in a series of videos giving advice on creating comics. Today we're going to be focusing on writing, and I'll be using my own published comics uh, as examples. Well, let's not waste any time. Let's just go ahead and get into it. All right, well, the first piece of advice here is maybe the most famous and enduring piece of writing advice uh, of all time. It is show, don't tell. Now, I'm sure many of you have uh, heard this one before, but uh, in case you haven't, it is well worth uh, putting out there. I'm going to be using a sort of a negative example to begin with, and then hopefully a positive example uh, immediately afterwards. This is my very first uh, comic book story that I... Uh, did really from beginning to end that was of publishable quality. It's called The Beast That Ate Morioka. I did this in my uh, sort of uh, mid-twenties, I guess I would say, and uh, at one point I decided to introduce the bad guy character, and uh, here maybe I can sort of uh, zoom in. Hang on a second. So uh, this is a, a page in which I introduce the bad guy character. Who is this mysterious man spying on our heroes? Where did he come from and what are his intentions? Uh, and beginning here, you know, for the answers to those questions, we must go back in time to the year 1973. And I proceed to fill the entire page basically with just text, uh, telling the reader all the stuff that I want them to know about this bad guy. Uh, it would be much more interesting if I had somehow found a way to show uh, his story by way of flashbacks or something, you know, a few scenes that kind of spell things out. It's always more interesting to show the reader something and allow them to draw information out of that scene rather than to just tell uh, it all to them. Look at this. It's not even comic books at this page. I'm just spelling it all out, just writing it all out, telling um, the, the reader everything I want them to know. That is really not great storytelling. Um, and uh, what you want to do is uh, try to show the reader something. Now, I'm going to give you a sort of uh, uh, example that uh, shows you how I was kind of getting it wrong for a second. Hang on, let me refocus again. So in the first book of Brody's Ghost, uh, I have a scene where Brody sees the ghost, Talia, for the very first time. And in the original proposed uh, layout for, the, for these two pages, uh, I had these little text boxes here, uh, Brody being the narrator of his own story. And here it says, Every inch of her had become translucent like frosted glass. She hovered there in the sky for a moment, peering down at me, then soundlessly, wordlessly descended. Now, uh, interestingly, my um, editor at that time, a great guy by the name of Dave Land, he was my editor at uh, Dark Horse, um, he uh, told me that this kind of stuff is what we call <laughs> explaino. Um, narration in comics that is telling you something that is already visible in the story. It's sort of doubling up, repeating information that really doesn't need to be told to the reader uh, because it is being shown to the reader. And so, as a result of the actual published book, we just yanked all that text out. And uh, you see, there it is, the finished uh, published book has none of that uh, text at all. Why? Because we didn't need it. It just wasn't necessary. Let the reader uh, see what's happening uh, and understand, yes, she's uh, descending to him. We, they don't need to be told that. Uh, the readers can kind of figure it out. And even if they don't know every single, you know, little drop of information that you thought needed to be conveyed to them, uh, they'll have more fun just sort of piecing it together than if you spell it out to them. So, uh, basically, there's my uh, little spiel on show, don't tell. Okay, so the next piece of advice is this one. Don't always go with the first idea that pops into your head. And I'm going to use as an example from Miki Falls uh, this character called Anra. Now, I can't get too far into this because it maybe gives away plot details, but believe it or not, Anra, this character, my first idea was to have that sort of whole part of the story be um, conveyed by way of uh, an amulet that was worn around the neck uh, of this character, Hiro. And um, as I, that was the first plan for the story, and as I got further into it, I thought, boy, an amulet, just a necklace kind of a thing? There's got to be a more interesting way of doing this. And that's when I thought, well, how about if we create a character uh, that, that fulfills the magical um, 
duties that this uh, necklace amulet thing was going to uh, fulfill, that, and it, it seemed like a much more interesting way of doing it. And so as a result, we have this whole new character in the story, uh, Anra. So that's an example of not going with the first idea that popped into my head. Um, and, you know, as you continue writing things, you may find that you're, you're getting this nagging feeling about this idea that seemed like, uh, you know, a good idea, or it was indeed the first thing that presented itself to you. And that nagging feeling is telling you, there's got to be a better idea. There's got to be a better way of doing this. And I would say, heed that nagging voice. That voice is driving you towards the second, or the third, or the fourth idea that you come up with, the more interesting idea. Uh, hopefully, the best idea for your story. Okay, this next one I feel is pretty important, and I sum it up this way. Uh, consider the reader's experience at all times. Now that's a little vague, and it may be hard to understand what I'm talking about. I'm going to give you an, an example here. In Brody's Ghost Book 5, I had a scene of dialogue between Talia the Ghost and Brody that really needed to go on for quite some time. You know, unfortunately, there were just certain things that need to be needed to be put across in the story. And so they go through several scenes in this room of dialogue, and then uh, Talia sort of explodes in this moment of, there is no they, Brody. Now, I can't explain what she means by that, but I, because uh, I, I don't want to give away spoilers, but you can see that there's a pause in the conversation, and, and uh, Talia leaves the room, Brody follows her out onto this balcony, and then the, the dialogue continues um, in a slightly different way with a slightly different tone to it. Um, the reason I built in this gap here is because I was thinking about the reader's experience of this conversation. And I thought, you know, boy, we've been in this room for a long time. We've had them talking to each other for a long time. The reader needs a break. And so... That's what I mean by this phrase of, uh, you know, consider the reader's experience. Don't, don't forget how the reader feels going through page after page of dialogue. You may need to build in a break. You may need to save certain things for another scene. Don't get so wrapped up in what you want to put into your story that you forget about the reader. Never forget about the reader. <laughs> it's crucial that uh, you read this from the point of view of the reader and consider the possibility they, that they may be getting tired of this dialogue dialogue scene of yours, uh, and that it's time for you to, to build in some kind of an intermission. Anyway, that's my example of how I did it, how I dealt with this uh, prolonged conversation scene. Uh, hopefully in a way that kept it interesting for the reader. Now here we have our first piece of advice related to dialogue. Give each character a specific way of speaking. Now, there's no better example for my comics than my first published uh, series, Akiko, uh, in which we have these two characters, Spuckler and Mr. Biba. Now, here we see Akiko is trying to wake up Mr. Biba, and Spuckler says, Here, let me help you out there. Smack! Just knocks him across the face, and he says, Look alive, Biebs! The snake's starting to fidget! And Mr. Biba says, Don't you know any civilized ways of rousing a fellow from slumber? Worked, didn't it? So in these three different uh, word balloons here, you see their different ways of speaking, how it conveys their personalities. Uh, I always had Spuckler use sort of cowboyish uh, words like fidget and so forth. And uh, With Mr. Biba, I always try to find the longest, most fancy way of speaking to kind of show off his uh, vocabulary, rousing a fellow from slumber instead of just waking someone up. Uh, so, by way of the dialogue, we get to know who they are. And this may be a slightly extreme example, but um, I really do believe that you should try to have every one of your characters speak uh, in a slightly different way. All right, now I think this is a very important piece of advice, and I have never heard this advice summed up in a particular way. I've come up with my own way of saying it, and it is this. It can't just happen. It has to happen in an interesting way. Um, so let me go ahead and give an example here from Brody's Ghost Book 3. I knew that Brody needed to go to this pawn shop and buy a policeman's badge so that he could uh, impersonate a policeman later on in the story. So basically he needs to go into the store, buy the badge, and leave. Well, if I had him actually do that, that's incredibly boring <laughs> in terms of, there's no drama in someone just going in and buying something. I had to make it more interesting. So first of all, I came up with this idea that the guy who uh, runs the place, um, has a sort of a back room. Brody has to bribe his way in. He throws this uh, $20 bill uh, on the 
counter, and then the guy allows him back to see the actual badge. But still, it wasn't interesting enough to me to have Brody simply pay the $200 and get it. So uh, I have him go through a bit of dialogue with Talia, and then, and this didn't occur to me until I was writing the scene, basically, uh, I have the guy uh, who we think of as a pretty tough guy, uh, overhearing this conversation. Now, Talia is invisible to the man. Only Brody can see the ghost or hear the ghost. The guy can't hear any of what Talia is saying. He only hears Brody sort of speaking to an imaginary person. And he says, you lost your mother, didn't you? And Brody says, huh? I heard you talking to her, arguing with her, trying to decide if you're going to take her advice. And Brody doesn't know how to react to that, and he says, It's nothing to be ashamed of. I talk to mine all the time. God rest her soul. And so we start to understand that the guy thinks that Brody is uh, speaking to his deceased mother. And so Brody decides to play along with it, and he says, Yeah, sometimes it's like she's right here beside me. And uh, the guy gets this emotional look on his face. says, Buddy, I heard what you were saying about making rent. Believe me, I've been there. And he throws it through the air, Brody catches it. This one's on the house. Go on, get out of here before I change my mind. So uh, uh, basically, I came up with this little twist here that Brody uh, fortunately doesn't even have to buy the thing. The guy, by way of a misunderstanding, uh, just tosses it to him for free. And uh, hopefully you'll agree. That's a, a more interesting way of getting <laughs> this badge into Brody's hands than if he had just gone into the place and bought it. So there you go, my little piece of advice. It, I come to it again and again throughout my stories. It can't just happen. It has to happen in an interesting way. Okay, now some people may take or leave this piece of advice. There's differing schools of thought here, but uh, it is this. Work out your ending. Uh, that is to say, try to figure out what your ending is before you write the story. Um, now I'm going to give you an example of a story, my very first uh, Akiko story, Akiko on the Planet Smoo, uh, in which I didn't know my ending. I was kind of making it up as I went along, and uh, there's this scene at the end. He, she was supposed to be rescuing the prince of Smoo, and suddenly, at the end of the story, the, uh, the king of Smoo comes out with the prince, and uh, Akiko's like, but I don't get it. How did you find the prince? And uh, Spockler says, why, he was never lost in the first place. The whole thing was just a big test. <laughs> and Mr. Beaver says, to see if you were the right sort of girl to marry the prince. Uh, and she reacts by saying, marry him? Uh, but basically, uh, I have always felt a little ashamed of this ending. It's almost uh, as bad as having them wake up and having them say it was all a dream. Uh, and the truth is, I had painted myself into a corner. I needed to end the story quickly. And I decided, okay, uh, you know, this whole idea of trying to rescue the prince was just a huge test. Well... Um, I would say that's a very unsatisfying ending for a story. Not to say that this is a, a bad first effort. I, I, I take some pride in this first story that I made. But one of the lessons that I've learned over time is, you know, if I had worked out my ending in advance, I could have paced everything more properly and, and had it end, uh, you know, in a more satisfying way. So uh, a little cautionary tale there uh, from my own experience. Um, at least consider uh, the approach of working out your ending in advance uh, so that you don't paint yourself into a corner as I did, uh, so that you can build towards uh, that ending uh, in the best way possible. Okay, now this one is a little bit related to my uh, piece of advice about saying, you know, it can't just happen. Uh, but uh, this one I think is a slightly different way of looking at it. Think of what the reader will expect and do something different. Okay, now, uh, in Miki Falls, I have this character named Reika, who is really a tough character. Uh, and uh, she, we've never seen any vulnerability in her, really, at all. Uh, in this scene, she uh, uh, has a confrontation. She kind of stirs up a confrontation with Miki. Miki comes along to kind of apologize. She says, look, Reika, I just want you to know uh, that what you said earlier isn't true. I don't hate you. And there's a pause, and Reika says, oh, yeah? Well, guess what? I don't need your pity. And uh, Miki says, no, Reika, that's not what I meant. I'm doing this for Hiro, not you. Understand that? I couldn't care less about you, Miki. And as a point of fact, if Hiro weren't here, if it was just the two of us, and she grabs, him, grabs Miki by the face and says, I swear to God, I'd kick your pretty little teeth in. Uh, 
Okay, so we've set her up as just about the toughest character we've seen in the whole story. And uh, Hiro steps in and says, all right, Reika, that's enough. And you, she spins around on Hiro and she says, you. And then suddenly there's tears streaming down her face and she basically breaks down uh, into Hiro's arms. And I don't want to read any further because it's kind of giving away a, a lot uh, to, to have, have even shown you this scene. But I do think it's a good example of, of thinking about what the reader will expect to happen and to do the opposite or to do something drastically different. Because we don't know this about Reika. We've never seen her break down before. And there's something very satisfying uh, uh, when you're reading a story in being surprised, in having a character surprise you. Uh, we've basically never seen this facial expression on Reika before. Uh, and so I think, you know, hopefully that's a good example of this idea of uh, anticipating what the reader's expectations are and subverting those expectations. Uh, always uh, trying to, uh, you know, pleasantly surprise them by showing them that they didn't know what was going to happen. Now, out of all these pieces of advice, the one uh, that I personally need to work on the most is, is this one. Uh, beware of the passive protagonist. Uh, what can happen in a lot of stories is that you create a main character that is, is sort of a stand-in for the reader. Uh, and the reader is experiencing all this stuff vicariously through uh, the main character. And sometimes, if you're not careful, your main character is just um, having a lot of things happen uh, to him or happen to her. And they're just being swept along by events. They're not actually altering the course of the story themselves. Uh, I want to use the Beast That Ate Morioka again, this time in a more positive light. This main character, uh, Hiroshi Okada, uh, and really for most of the story was, you know, I was guilty of this problem of just having him being swept along by the uh, wild things that were occurring in his life. But at this point, uh, without going too much into it, they've got a plot to help save the day that involves a gigantic <laughs> can of Asahi Super Dry, a uh, beer that is filled with wasabi. Don't ask. It, you got to read the story to understand what it means, but they're going to carry it into the sky with helicopters and lure the uh, giant uh, uh, monster, the beast, uh, called Snorky away into the countryside. And then at this point in the story, as the helicopters were flying uh, along with the, uh, with the giant can of wasabi, um, I had uh, a little twist happen here. Preoccupied with making the plan a success, the professor fails to notice that Hiroshi has disappeared. And I have uh, Hiroshi climbing down the wires onto the uh, giant can of wasabi, and he's saying, if Snorky is going to die, I'm going to die with him. And uh, he, the, the professor who's in charge of the plan says, okay, man, now! And then the can gets dropped down um, and uh, caught in the mouth. Uh, of the giant beast and Hiroshi right on top of his nose. Now, I'm not going to continue reading, because uh, that would give everything away. Actually, I don't know if anyone is ever going to be able to read this. It's kind of hard to get hold of this story. But I would point this out as maybe the first time that I uh, realized the value of having the main character, the protagonist, um, do something, uh, alter the course of the story by way uh, of his or her actions, uh, and it just makes the whole thing much better as a story when you don't have your main character um, being pushed around by the story, <laughs> uh, having them take uh, matters into their own hands and, and take some sort of decisive course of action like Hiroshi does right here. Very important. And as I said, it's something that I myself, as a writer, need to work on. Uh, throughout all my stories, I often have the main character, unfortunately, not being proactive enough, being a little too passive. So, uh, advice to both you and to me <laughs> on uh, storytelling. Uh, beware of the passive protagonist. Now here's a, a piece of advice that I've kind of come to gradually over time, uh, and I put it this way. Give the readers information just before they need it. Uh, which is to say, not pages and pages and pages in advance. Uh, let me give you an example here. In uh, Brody's Ghost, there is a sequence in which uh, Brody needs to break into uh, police headquarters. So I had to come up with a, you know, at least semi-believable manner in which uh, he would be allowed to do that. And I have this truck driver come along. Uh, and he picks up Brody, and um, there is an opportunity, really, for Brody to find out how it is that he's going to get 
into police headquarters. In fact, I have him ask, you know, uh, how exactly do you plan to get me into police headquarters? Well, rather than have uh, Splat, as I called the guy, his nickname, uh, give it all away, he says, hey, kid, relax, I've done this a million times. And then he just goes through this spiel that really doesn't give away anything about how it is that he proposes to get, um, you know, Brody into the presumably very heavily guarded police headquarters. Uh, and, uh, in fact, uh, all the way up until the last minute, we don't know how he's going to do it. Uh, and, and Splat has him crawl through this window into the back of the truck, and uh, he says, it's all the way uh, back by the doors, just uh, figure out how you're going to sit in there, that's the main thing. Uh, it's a pretty tight squeeze, and uh, you don't want your legs falling asleep on you. Uh, and, you know, all of this is basically uh, leaving the reader in the dark for quite a long time. What do you mean, uh, sit in there? Sit in where? What are you even talking about? Well, I'm trying to build a little bit of curiosity on the part of the reader until finally we see this sort of uh, dolly of uh, boxes that you would, you know, bring in to uh, some place for, like, delivery and uh, I have Brody come up to one side of it, and then uh, you, you only by way of visuals do you un understand, oh, okay, there's a passageway, and he crawls inside, and oh, so that's how they do it, you know. Well, if I had had uh, Splat explain this, well, I got this thing, you know, <laughs> it looks like I'm delivering boxes, but actually there's a hollow, you know, if you explain all that, there's no drama, it's no fun uh, for the reader to come to the information that way. And yet sometimes... Uh, people will do that kind of classic, okay, here's the plan, uh, kind of way of explaining everything to the reader in advance of it happening. Um, I really, uh, over time, have come to the conclusion that it, it's almost always more interesting to hold off until the last possible moment uh, before revealing, you know, any piece of uh, potentially interesting information to the reader. Well, we began with a very common piece of uh, writing advice show, Don't Tell, and we're going to end with an equally common piece of advice, uh, except the way I put it is maybe my own way, and I say, uh, if it's not working, be willing to toss it out. Uh, a really a variation on what some people sometimes refer to as uh, murder your darlings or, you know, be prepared to kill uh, uh, parts of the story that you maybe are personally in love with, but it's just not working and, and you have to be ruthless uh, against your own writing sometimes. In Brody's Ghost Book uh, 4, uh, there's this prolonged fight scene, and maybe it was a little too prolonged. I had uh, one, two, three different pages prepared of, of additional fighting that was to occur in that scene it was going on a little too long. This was pointed out to me by my editor, and she said basically the, um, you know, <laughs> the most terrifying thing of all to me. She said, it's actually, your, your fight scene is actually starting to get a little boring, Mark, because it's going on too long. And I was like, oh boy, I definitely don't want the fight scene to be boring. So yeah, I had to be prepared to toss out three different pages, and I had spent hours, uh, to be honest with you, devising the, the, this fight sequence, this stuff that was supposed to go in there, I had to be willing to toss it out. And uh, so, yeah, that's my final piece of advice there out of these ten. Um, if it's not working, be willing to throw it away. And uh, that brings us to the end of this video. One thing to keep in mind is that every one of these ten pieces of advice are not just about comic book writing. Uh, they can be applied to writing of any kind. Um, and so there's, how's that for a twist ending? <laughs> My first ever video that is really not about drawing at all, it's only about writing. Uh, I promise I won't do videos like this very often, but I did have a lot of people asking. Uh, for my advice on writing. And so there you have it. Uh, let me know what you thought about it. And if you would like me to do subsequent videos uh, that deal more with writing than with drawing, uh, let me know. I'd be happy to, to do them. But certainly next week we will have a uh, you know traditional Mark Curley how to draw video. Thank you so much for watching this video. I hope you enjoyed it. And I'll be back with another one real soon.